This is our fourth and last video covering Chapter 5 from your Operating Systems Textbook. In this video, we'll cover Section 5 of Chapter 5 on message passing. We'll talk about what message passing is, uh, how we deal with synchronization when we're using message passing, and then types of addressing, uh, we'll get a specific on types of indirect addressing, and talk about the general message format. Now, when we have multiple processes interacting with one another, they have to meet the following requirements. They have to be synchronized to enforce mutual exclusion, which we've talked a lot about in chapters four and five. And they also have to deal with communication to exchange information. So message passing is just one approach to providing both of these functions, and it works for distributed systems, shared memory multiprocessors, and uniprocessor systems. Message passing systems can come in many forms. They can be implemented in a lot of different ways. In this section, though, we're going to talk about a general introduction that discusses features typically found in such systems. The actual function of message passing is normally provided in the form of a pair of primitives, a send, which specifies the destination and the message itself, and receive, which takes the source of the message and the message itself. This is the minimum set of operations needed for processes to engage in message passing. A process sends information in the form of a message to another process designated by the destination, and a process receives information by executing the receive primitive, indicating the source and the message. So let's talk about synchronization. Now the communication of a message between two processes implies synchronization between the two, simply because a receiver can't receive a message unless it's actually been sent by another process. So, when a receive primitive is executed in a process, there's two possibilities. If there's no waiting message, the process blocks until the message arrives, or the process can continue to execute and abandon the attempt to receive a message. Now, if a message has previously been sent, the message is received, and then execution continues. So, both the sender and receiver can be blocking or non-blocking. Three combinations are common, although any particular system will usually have only one or two combinations implemented. First, with blocking send and blocking receive, both the sender and receiver are blocked until the message is delivered, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a rendezvous. This allows for tight synchronization between processes. Now, the most useful combination tends to be the non-blocking send, blocking receive. So the sender continues on, but the receiver blocks until the requested message arrives. The sender can send one or more messages to a variety of destinations as quickly as possible because it doesn't have to wait until those messages get received by the receiving processes. An example of this is some sort of service process that only exists to provide a service or resource to other processes. Finally, in the case of a non-blocking send and non-blocking receive, very simply, neither party has to wait for any kind of message passing to actually finish up. Now, when we're implementing message passing, we have to deal with addressing, uh, quite simply because a message has to be able to be addressed to a receiving process when it's sent from the sending process. Now, there's two categories for addressing messages, direct and indirect. Now, with direct addressing, the send primitive includes a specific identifier of the destination process. The receive primitive can be handled in one of two ways. One possibility is to require that the process explicitly designate a sending process. Thus, the process has to know ahead of time from which process a message is expected. This can be effective for cooperating concurrent processes, but in other cases, such as a print server, for example, we, it's impossible to specify the anticipated source process. Because, for example, a printer server process will accept a print request message from any other process. For such applications, a more effective approach is the use of implicit addressing. In this case, the source parameter of the receive primitive possesses a value returned when the receive operation has been performed. So, the receiving process gets the address of the source process during the receive operation. With indirect addressing, on the other hand, messages are sent to a shared data structure consisting of a queue or queues that can temporarily hold messages. These queues are generally referred to as mailboxes, uh, and one processor sends a message to the mailbox, the other process picks up the message from the mailbox. 
Now, by decoupling the addressing from individual processes like this, we can allow for greater flexibility in the use of messaging. Now, let's take a look at four different relationships that we can have between senders and receivers when using indirect addressing. We can have a one-to-one -one relationship, a many-to-one, -one, a one-to-many, or a many-to-many. -many. In a one-to-one -one relationship, we can allow for private communication link to be set up between two processes. This insulates the interaction from erroneous interference from other processes. Now, a many-to-one relationship is useful for, for example, client-server interactions. One process provides service to a number of other processes, and in this case, the mailbox is often referred to as a port. A one-to-many relationship allows for one sender and multiple receivers. This is useful for applications where a message or some information is to be broadcast to a set of processes. And a many-to-many -many relationship allows multiple server processes to provide concurrent service to multiple clients. Now, the format of the message depends on the objectives of the messaging facility and whether the facility runs on a single computer or on a distributed system. For some OSs, designers have preferred short, fixed-length messages to minimize processing and storage overhead. If a large amount of data has to be passed, the data can be placed in a file and the message then simply references that file. A more flexible approach is to allow variable length messages. This figure shows a typical message format for OSs that support variable length messages. We divide the message into two parts, a header and a body. The header contains meta information, information about the message itself. It can contain identification of the source and intended destination, the length, the type field to discriminate against uh, among various types of messages, and additional control information, which could include a pointer field so a linked list message can be created, a sequence number to keep track of the number and order of messages passed between source and destination, and maybe a priority field. The body simply contains the actual contents of the message. And that does it for Chapter 5. Our next series of videos will be covering Chapter 6 of your Operating Systems textbook, where we'll still be talking about concurrency, but we'll focus in on deadlock and starvation.